So this is the third in a series on preventing disability. Uh, this series is on stroke, the number one cause of disability in this country. Um, <clears throat> you may think, I don't know many people that have had a stroke. Um, and that's the, probably true. Once you've had a stroke, uh, if you're over 65, your probability of having a significant disability is over one half. So when you have a stroke and you're in your 60s, you're very likely to have a massive change in your lifestyle. End up in a nursing home, end up in a wheelchair. Uh, again, not spending a lot of time going out to restaurants and church and movies. Um, <clears throat> this, this video is gonna focus on the stroke gene. Um, we spent some time uh, looking at, at 4Q25, the atrial fib gene, also the stroke gene. Um, <clears throat> The uh, last video in this series, we looked at when it was discovered back in the early uh, 2000s, 2005, 2006, 2007, and 8. We looked at an article in 08 in the Annals of Neurology, which uh, showed how <clears throat> there are a lot of, uh, of strokes that appeared to be associated with 4Q25, the atrial fib gene. Even strokes that weren't known to be what we called cardioembolic. Cardio meaning heart, embolic meaning uh, clot. So cardioembolic strokes were strokes that uh, they knew had happened due to atrial fib. So they already knew prior to this research that atrial fib was a major cause of uh, strokes. What they didn't know was that <clears throat> there were a huge number of strokes that what they called cryptogenic or um, Crypto meaning don't know, and genic mean origin. So they didn't know the origin. Then they began to find this same 4Q25 risk gene in a huge number of those people that had what was known as cryptogenic. In other words, what they were finding is maybe there is a atrial fib that's far more common than we thought. And sure enough, over the past 10 years, that's exactly what we found. We found some other things over the past 10 years in this area as well. And that's what this study is, this video uh, in this study is going to cover. Now, the um, couple of things. Let's look as usual at the name of the journal, the date. This was Jack, the Journal of the American College of, College of Cardiology, 2017. So far more recent. As you may remember, the first uh, study we did in this area on the stroke gene <clears throat> basically covered two areas, uh, both in the fourth uh, chromosome, Q25 area, so 4Q25. As you'll see in this one, by this time there are over 30 locations. They discovered three more locations. Now, <clears throat> let's get into the study itself. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on it because again, it gets fairly technical and we just wanna make a few comments about how the study was done and what it means. This was done by, well actually, let me go back. Look at those last names again. Um, Thoris Dutter, Svan Bjornsson. Uh, these are uh, Icelandic names. This again came from the Decode project. It's a, it's a project in, uh, in Iceland where there's a huge uh, code, uh, gene code um, discovery engine. They've got a, a huge uh, database of people that have uh, donated their uh, genetic materials, a sample of genetic material. And so they're able to go back and look and say, okay, we've got thousands of people, tens and hundreds of thousands of samples. If we wanna look at something like stroke, Let's find a, a few thousand people that have had stroke, look at their, um, their genetics, and get a bunch of controls and look at their genetics. And that's exactly what they did with this study. That's what they did with the original study that we talked about back in 08. <clears throat> so uh, they had 14,255 people with strokes. Um, they compared that to 374,000 uh, folks that had not had strokes. And this is called a GWAS Genome-Wide Association Study. Those have become very popular, very common, and again, <clears throat> a major tool in these gene discovery engines. 
Now, what they discovered here was that there were two novel atriofib variants. These two, we're not going to get in de into detail on the names of those. But then another area where you have a missense variant in uh, PLAC. Um, again, not going to focus too much on those, other than to say that's in addition to 29 previously reported atriofib variants. Unfortunately, as you know, I have a lot of challenges sometimes getting the video component to work. What you're not seeing down below this screen is an EKG showing atrial fib and a statement that <clears throat> there are various impacts on what's called the sarcomeres. What is a sarcomere? Uh, sarco means muscle and mere means a tendril within the muscle. So <clears throat> uh, there are also some variants that have a, an entirely different impact, but again, creating atrial fib. So <clears throat> what does that mean? Uh, maybe curious for some sort of uh, uh, medical science wookie or, or geek, uh, but what does it mean in terms of practical information? Uh, it means a good bit. It means that uh, you should think twice if you have um, atrial fib and you go to see a cardiologist and the cardiologist says, you know what, I think I need, we need to do an ablation if you look at this study, and we'll cover it a little bit later, um, basically what it's saying is, as you begin to look at these uh, SNPs, these um, atrial fib or stroke genes, if people have these genes, they're much more likely to have a failure in the ablation process. Again, we won't have time to cover all of that in this video, we'll cover it later, but it helps you understand uh, now that we're beginning to realize how many risk genes there are, and now that we're beginning to realize that uh, risk genes can end up causing stroke and atrial fib, we also are beginning to connect the dots. Up to 30% of ablations, which are supposed to cure atrial fib, fail. And again, those ablations tend to fail much more commonly in people that have the heart attack, I mean, the uh, atrial fib gene. Speaking of the heart attack gene, let's go back to uh, an old Bale Dunin slide. Um, actually, it's a fairly current slide. If you, uh, I've mentioned Bale and Dunin, they wrote the, the book, The Heart Attack Gene. And let's just cover some cardiogenetics for just a minute. As we just saw with the stroke gene, um, this tells us something very different about um, genetic testing. In other words, if you have um, if you have a genetic test and it shows you, look, you've got a, the atrial fib gene, you know that you have the atrial fib gene. However, there are only two atrial fib um, gene items or copies that are that are in the kits that labs use right now. So you could get an atrial fib gene test, it comes back negative, but it doesn't tell you about the other 30 or the other 29 uh, gene focus points that we just discussed in this, uh, in this article. So <clears throat> that's actually fairly prevalent in most of genetics. We find more and more areas or focus points for a, uh, for a risk gene. So if you get the positive gene, you know you've got it. If you get a negative on the gene, you just you know that you don't have the variations uh, that are available in, uh, for public testing. 9P21, or the heart attack gene, is the same way. We, uh, at this point, there are over two dozen focus points for that gene. If you have one of them, you're tested and you have one of them, you know. However, uh, you can still, there are only four that are being tested right now, again, out of two dozen. Um, one of the other uh, genetic, cardiogenetic components that's not listed here in the Bale-Dunin slide is, uh, is PCK, PCSK9. With PCSK9s, those cause familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, errors in those, in those areas or high-risk gene uh, variants or SNPs in those areas. Again, over, um, 2,000 different variations. 
there are only four. There used to be two that are uh, available, uh, then four, and they're about to have four more that are available for testing in the public. So I've had patients, for example, that we clearly felt had, clinically had um, familial hypercholesterolemia, but they tested negative for the FH genes. Now, <clears throat> what does that mean? Again, as we discussed a minute ago, ablation is a very common recommendation by uh, interventional cardiologists upon discovery of atrial fib. Ablation tends to uh, be far less successful and fail far more if you have these genes. Now, <clears throat> so again, this is what we covered today, this article on now we're up to 31 genes, gene locations that lead to stroke. Now, <clears throat> let's go back and talk about, for those of you who, have, who haven't seen any of the other stroke videos, let's just go back and talk about some of the, uh, the basic information uh, from the CDC. Stroke kills about 140,000 Americans each year. Almost a million have strokes each year. It's one out of every 20 deaths. Every 40 seconds, somebody has a stroke. Every four minutes, somebody dies from one. 87% of all strokes are ischemic, meaning loss of blood coming from a clot. Um, <clears throat> strokes cost $34 billion with a B each year. And uh, at the very bottom, some of it's cut off, again, a major lifestyle component. Strokes reduced mobility in more than half of people 65 and older that have a stroke. So again, you maybe don't see a lot of those folks is because their life has changed. They're now spending time looking at uh, wheelchair accessories, uh, wheel, uh, ways to get their wheelchair in and out of their home. They don't get out much. So <clears throat> how about risk? You're not at risk, right? Well, even the CDC very conservatively says a third of us have at least one of the leading, leading causes of risk. And if you look through here, you see that um, atrial fibrillation is not even listed here. Is there any good news? Yes, of course. Actually, four out of five uh, strokes are preventable, according to the CDC. And again, I think they're being characteristically uh, very conservative there as well. We need to be aware of the key things that uh, cause risk. Most people know about um, loss of um, feeling on one side of the body, but most people don't know that confusion, um, loss of, uh, of speech are also major signs of stroke. So uh, there's a lot to learn. We will continue to focus on this area as we get a few more, uh, a few more facts out there for you. Thank you very much.